Um, I will um, take you through the final um, talk of the day. This is uh, Novel Treatment Strategies in IgA Nephropathy. Um, and these are my disclosures. Um, so uh, what I'm going to um, be discussing today when I say novel treatment strategies is really um, uh, the, the, not just the, the landscape of what treatment is now, but what we could expect it to be um, in the future, or potentially in the near future, um, and also what is uh, being done right now to understand the disease. And this is, um, you might have heard or, or, or you might have noticed that there's been a, an explosion of clinical trials in, in IgA nephropathy in recent years. So this um, graph at the bottom right shows the number of, of registered trials on clinicaltrials.gov um, uh, over the past uh, 25 years or so, and you can see the numbers have gone way up. And uh, there's a few reasons for this. There's clearly still a, a large unmet need in, in um, IgA nephropathy. Um, the disease remains morbid, um, patients are progressing, and the current treatments are uh, both uh, incompletely effective and have some um, undesirable side effects, in particular um, corticosteroids, systemic corticosteroids for sure. Um, number two, there's been, as sort of you've heard earlier today, a lot of new targets um, identified potential new targets, as well as new agents that have been developed that could, could work for those targets. And then number three, importantly, there's been sort of a lowering of the bar uh, for outcomes. Um, one of the problems with IgA nephropathy is it is a slowly progressive disease. And so it can take many years um, to develop the, the outcome that we really care about, which is end-stage kidney disease, that we care about the most, end-stage kidney disease. Um, but it was recognized uh, uh, by investigators and acknowledged by the FDA that in IgA nephropathy, proteinuria is actually a very good surrogate, not just for prognosis, but also it's a very good surrogate for treatment effect. In, in the majority of cases, treatments or therapies that lower proteinuria will improve um, renal outcomes. And so this gives us an opportunity by using the surrogate outcome to develop drugs and develop treatments that we can actually get potentially approved or provisionally approved now to treat patients now, um, even if it's not, you know, the the platonic ideal of of having um, a, a drug that shows a decrease in in you know number of dialysis, which for power reasons and and uh, economically makes it much much more difficult if you have such a high standard um, to develop a drug. So thanks to this, there's a lot to talk about. So. Um, I'll start just by, uh, by framing this in the sense of, of pathophysiology. And as you've um, heard earlier today, IgA nephropathy is a, has a complex pathophysiology and involves a lot of different aspects of the immune system. And so this means uh, a lot of complexity, but it also means a lot of opportunity. And so if we think about the four hit model as a, as a reasonably good model of, of IgA pathogenesis, we can think about at each hit different ways of intervening. So at hit one, the production of galactose deficient IgA1. That's dependent on lymphoid tissue. You can think about lymphoid tissue alteration. Uh, certainly this may be how tonsillectomy works or um, manipulating the floor of the GI tract. Um, you can think about glycosylation uh, modification or uh, targeting uh, the mucosa that products, uh, produces this type of IgA. And so targeted budesimide, for example, may, may affect HIT1. Um, the production of anti-glycan antibodies, you may think uh, in a more traditional um, uh, antibody-mediated uh, autoimmune disease type of, of framework and think about uh, agents that target B cells or plasma cells. Uh, for uh, the HIT3, where immune complex formation is, um, is occurring, you can think about co-stimulatory blockers, anti-proliferatives, um, and there's been uh, preclinical um, uh, studies of IgA proteases, actually, that can help d uh, digest um, the, the IgA molecules and, and uh, arrest the progression of this. And then in the sort of HIT4, the final kind of common pathway of glomerular sclerosis and mesangial inflammation, there's opportunities for anti-inflammatories, complement uh, inhibitors, um, as well as sort of um, more traditional CKD drugs like renin-angiotensin inhibitors and what you've already heard about uh, today, SGLT2 inhibitors. So I'd like to talk on five uh, basic emerging therapies. Um, and, and so, you know, this being a 30 minute talk, it'll give me about five minutes to, to mention each one. Um, and I'll start with SGLT2 inhibitors, which you've already heard about. And as Dr. Flerg uh, uh, 
covered earlier today, the KDGO guidelines really for IgA nephropathy um, uh, uniquely state that unlike the majority of other glomerular diseases, management is really focused on non-immunosuppressive based strategies or supportive care. And the first one of the first practice points when it comes to treatment, in fact, the first practice point when it comes to treatment is to focus on supportive care. And um, the STOP st uh, tr study, which um, has been mentioned several times, uh, I think gives us a good um, example of what supportive care can do. The STOP study was uh, a study of supportive care uh, versus immunosuppression, a randomized trial, where over 300 patients with IgA nephropathy were enrolled, and they went through uniquely at the time a run-in period where they really got optimal supportive care by Dr. Flerga and his colleagues in Germany for six months. And what happened when they did that is that there was some dropout, but there was also about a quarter, over a quarter of the people responded. And by responded means that their proteinuria, which um, had started off uh, fairly high, came down to below 0 0.75 uh, grams per day, and that was sustained. Um, and then the other patients went on to get randomized, and those were the non-responders, the ones who had still ha high proteinuria. And I won't discuss the, the later findings of the study, but the point is, is here is that with, with good supportive care, before you get to thinking about immunosuppression, which happens later, you can get a quarter of the people down to low levels of proteinuria, which are um, associated with a very good long-term outcomes. So that really raises the question. So what is supportive care? And, and you heard from Dr. Flerga what he does as far as lifestyle counseling, smoking cessation, weight loss, um, et cetera, RAS inhibition, blood pressure control. Um, I'll make the point uh, that, that KDGO actually suggests a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 and stop, they used 125. But um, many, many patients who we see in second opinion haven't gotten there. They might be 135 or, or 140. And so there, there's a lot that can be done. These are young patients who generally tolerate blood pressure lowering very well. They can be comfortable and not orthostatic, even down to uh, systolics that are quite a bit lower than this. Um, uh, mineral corticoid blockers, I, I put up here, uh, I often use them, and I there there is evidence that they do lower proteinuria when added to either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Um, that There's some evidence that they do that in IgA nephropathy as well. There's not really any long-term um, outcomes. Uh, certainly in diabetic kidney disease with the recent approval of finerenone, um, one can uh, think about these agents um, sort of being used off-label for, for this indication, but I've, I've for years, I and my colleagues have used uh, spironolactone or eplerinone as add-ons for, for kind of max, especially when, when there's um, uh, resistant um, hypertension. And then good CKD care. So really, all of this is really just being a good nephrologist, right? And I think increasingly, we've seen that, that good CKD care involves SGLT2 inhibitors. And uh, you saw this a little earlier, but the DAPA CKD study, which uh, included, it was, it was 4,000 people with diabetic and non-diabetic kidney disease, included 270 with IgA nephropathy. Um, and it did show this um, you know, sort of dramatic improvement. Now, this tracked with um, the overall uh, findings of the study. And as was mentioned earlier, you, you do have to be a little cautious because the placebo group kind of progressed a lot quicker. This is in months. So in um, nearly three years, there's uh, about 20% of them going on to having um, a, a primary renal outcome, which was 50% decrease in GFR or, or dialysis or, or death transplant or death of cardiovascular or renal disease or, or transplant. So that that may be a little bit exaggerated, but um, but clearly this tracked with the overall findings of the study. Um, one thing that is important to think about in as far as IgA patients, uh, IgA nephropathy patients, those who are in, in this study could not have any immunosuppression without the p past six months, and they could not have an immune-mediated kidney disease thought to require immunosuppression. So uh, uh, these were really um, not a, a general IgA nephropathy population. These were perhaps the more chronic, uh, they were certainly older, more of a kind of socked in, uh, sclerosing, CKD um, type of form of IgA nephropathy. The point is here is that the SGLT2 inhibitors work for patients with that. Um, the lower blood pressure, as you can see here, they lower albuminuria, so they do all the things that we want them to do. And the one thing to be careful of is that they do have this very, very typical uh, pattern um, which is true, uh, you know, of many of the drugs we use in nephrology and which uh, drives some of our internal medicine colleagues uh, crazy is that we give drugs that lower GFR and SGLT2 inhibitors lower GFR just like ACE inhibitors. You know, it's like on average like a four point drop or 10% drop and sometimes it can be even 20 or 30%. And we always have to counsel patients, expect the GFR to go down. It is okay. It is a desired effect. It means the drug is working. 
The payoff will happen later on. Uh, don't worry about the GFR going down right now. We know it's going to happen. Um, uh, I always uh, tell my patients, it's like we're telling the kidneys to take a break, not work too hard, and they'll do better over the long term. Okay, so um, the other thing that was important from DAPA-CKD is that, uh, and this is from the, the larger trials, that this was a really, really well-tolerated um, drug. And in fact, if you look at adverse events, there were fewer serious adverse events in the active arm than in the placebo arm. Um, so these are well-tolerated drugs in this population. EMPA kidney was just published, um, really uh, using epiglyphosin instead of dapagliflozin, and a submaximal dose. Uh, they only use 10 milligrams a day, and, and this uh, drug is available to 25 milligrams a day as well. Um, over 6,000 patients. Now they've published the. Um, uh, th that 1,600 of the patients had glomerular disease. Um, the the sub study just of IgA, IgA nephropathy uh, patients has not been published, um, but will be looked at. Um, but um, again, this excluded immunosuppression within the past three months, and the the results track. the The drug works. Um, it seems to work even at very low GFRs. You can see here at, at a GFR less than 30, there was still a substantial benefit, and. It, this is, you know, um, uh, hypothesis generating, but it seems to have the most benefit the more proteinuria there is. And, and this is really um, similar to what we see in, say, uh, ACE inhibitors as well, where the more, more proteinuria there is, the more benefit there is. Um, this is a meta-analysis that was also just uh, published. Both EMPA kidney and this meta-analysis coincided with the ASN meeting last month. Um, and it shows, if you look at just the glomerular disease subgroup of both DAPA and EMPA, and this is all glomerular disease, not just IgA nephropathy, but I think it, it applies pretty well. Um, there is a substantial beneficial effect. The, the risk reduction was, was 0 0.6. And as far as concerning things patients might bring up, um, ketoacidosis and limb amputations, in this meta-analysis, when it compared the diabetic versus the non-diabetic CKD, those things, although they're rare and you know, outweighed by the benefits here. This is um, events per pa thousand patient years. In the non-diabetic um, patients, they're even more rare. So, you know, basically an undetectable amount of ketoacidosis and lower limb amputation. So these drugs are very safe in this population, particularly with non-diabetic kidney disease. And the results, the beneficial results are very clear. Okay, so uh, another strategy that um, uh, is uh, being actively per pursued is that of endothelin antagonism. Endothelin is a peptide produced by the vasculature. Uh, its expression is uh, associated with proteinuria and progression in, in CKD and in IgA nephropathy. And there are drugs which block endothelin, and these drugs increase vasodilation, lower blood pressure, and they ameliorate uh, fibrosis as well. Um, there's other actions that, that may be relevant of endothelin as far as uh, in the kidney, as far as mesangial proliferation, tubular interstitial fibrosis. There's several drugs that have been um, approved. They're not without risk. So atrocentan, which is being actively developed, um, does have risks of, of fluid retention and CHF that came out in a study in diabetic chronic kidney disease. Um, Bosentan uh, is approved for the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, and Cytaxentan was and is now off the market because both of these drugs actually have a risk of hepatotoxicity. So Cytaxentan was approved in Europe and was actually removed from the market, I think it was by Pfizer, because of uh, hepatotoxicity. This has not been seen in every single endothelin antagonist, um, but, but it, it was seen in those. So Atrocentan, which um, you know, had been, was being looked at in diabetic kidney disease, uh, is being studied in IgA nephropathy as well. This is a selective endothelin A antagonist. And there's um, uh, early um, results that uh, have been presented from um, the phase two studies so at the ERA earlier this year and at the ASN just a few weeks ago. And you can see in 20 patients with IgA nephropathy, um, unoptimized um, uh, RAS inhibitors with um, uh, some amount of proteinuria, they were able to reduce their proteinuria substantially out to about six months uh, on antracentin. Um, Sparsentan has, has somewhat um, uh, more advanced data. So there's a, a, a Sparsentan is a slightly different drug. It's an endothelin A as well as angiotensin II receptor blocker. And there's a study which we are we actually have completed enrollment um, at uh, at Columbia. It's called the Protect study um, of this drug for IgA nephropathy. It's also being studied, um, and we participated in, in in the earlier studies as well for FSGS, the duet and duplex studies. And, and so the PROTECT is a phase three study. 
where um, sparsentan is being compared to herbisartan. Again, sparsentan has angiotensin II receptor uh, blocker activity in it. Um, so it's a head-to-head -head comparison in people with proteinuria over a gram, GFR over 30. Over 400 patients have been enrolled. And the company announced as top line um, results for the first 280 patients. And it showed, um, similar to what you see here, uh, about a 50% decrease uh, in sparsentin. And that's compared to about 15% in the control arm, which is herbisartin, but it's still 35% lower. So really, really uh, encouraging. Um, the follow-up is continuing and is going to include GFR data. Um, this drug was submitted, a new drug application was submitted to the FDA um, for the accelerated approval pathway. It was granted prior priority review earlier this year. Um, the target action was actually supposed to be um, in November. That's been pushed back at least three months. They've uh, Actually, the FDA is now requiring um, a, a REMS for, for liver monitoring, I think in part because of this um, you know, cla not class effect, but but other drugs in the class having hepatotoxicity like Bosentin. So this should be available um, hopefully in the first half of, of 2023. Um, next, let's go on to glucocorticoids. So traditionally, glucocorticoids have been used for IgA nephropathy, and this is a, a meta-analysis which shows that traditional types of regimens of high-dose systemic glucocorticoids usually used uh, for six months, things on the order of a mg per kg per day of prednisone for a few months and then tapering. Um, there's different regimens, but they, they seem to improve renal outcomes. It has a ratio here of, of 0 0.32 from this meta-analysis. The testing study examined this. Um, the testing study was done um, uh, uh, to, to really strictly answer the question of, of the effects of, of glucocorticoids in a, in a sort of uh, rigorous way, and it used methylprednisolone compared to standard care. Um, and it started off, it's been published in sort of two uh, sets because it started off enrollment was mostly in China, it tended to be across the Pacific Rim, including Australia, um, but it was actually stopped, stopped early or paused, I should say, rather than stopped because of adverse events in the methylprednisolone arm. And there was, um, among the first 262 patients, which was published in JAMA in 2017, 11 serious infections, including two deaths. Um, so again, this is for IgA nephropathy, you know, a, a renal limited disease that, that generally affects young and healthy people. So this was really concerning and the study was, was paused. Um, Examining the results at that time, though, did show better kidney outcomes in the steroid arm. There was better GFR, there was lower proteinuria, and there was fewer composite kidney failure outcomes. And to the credit of the investigators, they soldiered on. They, they changed the protocol to try to protect from these um, infections and, and adverse events, and then uh, continued the study. And the changes they made was to lower the steroid dose and to add antibiotic prophylaxis. And thus, they enrolled an additional um, 241 patients and got over 500 patients in all and published these results earlier this year. And what they showed is if, if you compare the high dose uh, to the reduced dose within the study, um, and, and this is the treatment regimen, the original high dose was 0.6 to 0.8 milligrams per kg of methylprednisolone, maxing at 48, which is 60 milligrams of prednisone. The lower dose was uh, about, um, uh, you know, two thirds of that, um, uh, uh, half to two thirds of that, and they added antibiotic uh, prophylaxis against pneumocystis for for twelve weeks. Which is, um, since this is tapering, that's that's just giving, you know, for the first half really when they're on the highest dose of the steroids. Um, the primary composite outcome you can see was uh, for, for renal outcomes was excellent with both high dose, but just as good with the reduced dose. It um, doesn't have as long of a follow-up, but it still is, is clearly uh, right in line. And the adverse events, on the other hand, were less with the reduced dose. So it seems like you can try to channel some of that benefit with less harm. And in fact, they pointed out that uh, with this reduced dose, the number needed to treat to, to prevent one renal outcome was seven, whereas the number needed to try needed to harm uh, with a serious adverse event was 13. Um, now you can take this and make an informed decision with your patient uh, on the relative risks and benefits looking at your own patient characteristics, but it helps to show that you can harness some of the benefits of these drugs in a safer way. And these are, this is from the combined cohort, both low, low and high dose, and really every renal outcome tracks improvement. There's 
the primary outcome, certainly, the hazard ratio is 0.5, um, similar to what you saw in that earlier meta-analysis. The rate of G GFR decline was roughly half. Proteinuria went down something like 25%. Um, and, and there was less dialysis or transplant, and the death in the two arms was, was statistically insignificantly uh, uh, be between them. So I think the conclusions here are that systemic leukocorticoids work as far as they improve renal outcomes, um, but they have these risks, and we know about the risks, and we're not even going into the practical risks of, of how difficult it is to manage people on the drugs, real life patients who suffer from insomnia and uh, stretch marks and acne and weight gain and hyperglycemia. So we, we know all this and nobody likes these drugs, certainly if you talk to, to patient groups and there was a, an FDA program before COVID where patient groups came to the FDA and talked about um, IgA nephropathy and a lot of what we heard was how much they disliked prednisone. Um, so the reduced dose regimens can give you the same benefit, but lower the risk compared to traditional doses. So this is important to remember. And if you're going to use systemic steroids, I think it's clear that you should use the reduced dose as was done in testing uh, in, in 2022 and going forward. This also brings up the question, can we get some of these benefits without uh, all that risk? And that is the strategy that's been used with, with targeted budesonide. Um, Dr. Flerga mentioned before, uh, this drug was developed as, as Neficon. It's now marketed in the U.S. as Tarpeo, and it was earlier this year approved um, in Europe, uh, a, a provisional approval with uh, the name Kimpago. Um, this is a formulation of budesonide that um, is designed to be released in the Pyres patches uh, of the intestine, and it has a, a high 90% first-pass metabolism, uh, in order to um, limit systemic exposure to the drug. Um, so the drug had gotten provisional approval earlier, uh, sorry, at the end of 2021, and the results of the phase three study were just published in Kidney International um, just about a month ago, I think at the end of October. And what you can see is that um, in the active treatment arm, there was a 27% reduction in proteinuria, um, and at 12 months, 48% reduction versus uh, placebo. You can see proteinuria here um, going down, whereas placebo, it's basically flat. Um, and uh, GFR uh, slope actually improved um, uh, by three mils per minute um, in the active treatment arm as well. And it was fairly safe. Um, so uh, uh, treatment emergent adverse events were slightly higher, but there was no severe infections requiring hospitalization, at least in this um, first 12 months. And uh, the drug is available. And the question, of course, always uh, comes up is what about safety and tolerability? And I've already gotten this question a lot from, from some of my colleagues. And uh, you know we'll have to see uh, over the long term, but at least uh, preliminarily, it seems to be fairly well tolerated. Um, it doesn't mean it has no uh, adverse events. If you, if you look at the trial data, there was nine discontinuations in the budesonide arm versus just one in the placebo two cases of diabetes versus none in the placebo, um, but there was no increase in serious infections, small increases in blood pressure and weight um, in the, with budesonide treatment that were you know, deemed to be not clinically relevant or not clinically significant and seemed to resolve um, within three months at the end of treatment. So I think you are getting some of the steroid effects, some of the systemic steroid effect, but it's, it's much milder than, than um, systemic steroids dosed orally. And these are some of the other adverse events that you can see. Um, again, the numbers are small, um, uh, but, but not to say that the, the, the drug is, is completely without effect. And so again, this is um, uh, fairly special in the field because this is the first approval of a drug for IG nephropathy specifically. And it is a conditional approval, which means that there's an ongoing study, which, which you know, we have patients in right now because we were, were part of the phase three study, uh, who remain on the drug in order to confirm that the, the kidney function is uh, decline will be seen. And I think this is important because um, it allows this sort of mechanism from the FDA allows a drug to get on the market, to get to patients, to give them some hope while also making sure that, um, you know, though the, the early evidence suggests that there's probably going to be some long-term benefit, at least we can quantify that with the, with the post-approval studies. Um, so I'll move on to some other novel agents that are, are not yet approved, but are being um, uh, looked at quite aggressively. Um, so April and BAF signaling blockers. Um, now, uh, we discussed a little bit in the, I think, in the chat, but um, a few years ago, um, 
I and my colleagues and Richard Lafayette at Stanford was the first author, Fernando Fervenz at the Mayo was the last author, did a small study of rituximab in IgA nephropathy. And without going into the, the details of it, it was a small study, it was randomized, but rituximab didn't affect GFR, it didn't affect proteinuria. And when we looked at biomarkers of disease pathogenesis, the GAL deficient IgA1 levels and anti-glycan um, antibodies, there was no effect from the rituximab. So it really did not seem to have either a clinical or a biological effect on the disease. So rituximab is an anti-CD20 drug and it really targets B cells. But we know from data that Dr. Kerlick showed you that there is this um, aspect of B cell activation, which is important, and it goes through this, the, April and BAF pathway, and um, these are uh, TNF-like, um, uh, these are receptors for TNF-like ligands that activate um, B cells. And there is, uh, in light of the clear genetic evidence here, there's been a slew of drugs developed and tested for IgA nephropathy that target this pathway. Um, so April and BAF signaling is, um, is not strictly limited uh, to just B cells. In fact, it, it affects other aspects uh, of lymphocyte life, like plasma cell survival and IgA class switching. So I think this, this is different than, than targeting CD20, and there's reason to think that, that you can have an effect here that you might not have with a simple CD20 drug. Um, I'll show you some early evidence. Uh, Atacacept is one such um, drug. It's a, a human a fusion protein of IgG1 and, and TACI, which is a receptor here that, that blocks the activation of both, that blocks the effect of both BAF and April on um, B cells and plasma cells as well. And this is data that was presented actually last year's ASN and was just published, uh, published in KIR earlier this year that shows that in a small preliminary study, phase two data, Atacacept reduced proteinuria, but also unlike rituximab, for example, also reduced GAL-deficient IgA1 levels, which are associated with disease pathogenesis. So this is um, uh, uh, early data, and the, the drug is now being studied in phase three. Teletacacept is a similar um, agent that, again, in, in phase two data, it seems to reduce uh, IgA levels. This is all IgA, not just GAL-deficient, but also seems to reduce proteinuria. And um, on the other hand, you can see here in uh, uh, red is placebo, so proteinuria is flat, in the placebo group decreases in the active treatment arm. GFR decreases in the placebo group is flat or maybe up in the active treatment arm. So these are encouraging signals. Um, there's a, a couple of anti-April monoclonal antibodies that are uh, in active development. And there was early um, data presented at this uh, last ASN. Um, uh, in, I think one of them was in the, the late breaking clinical trials or the, the high impact clinical trial session. Um, and one of them was, was oral. Um, there's a, uh, this drug from Chinook by on 1301, which is dosed subcutaneously. And you can see decreases GAL deficient IJ1, decreases proteinuria at 24 weeks. Um, and that is sustained out at 52 to 100 weeks as well. And it's, it's, this is solid 50, 60, 70% proteinuria decline that you can see here. Um, Sibiprenlimab is an Atsuka agent, which is again, a, a monoclonal anti-April agent. Um, again, dosed sub-Q, this is every four weeks, or IV, and showed that it decreased proteinuria against placebo 43%, and this is a phase three study actively, actively recruiting right now. So finally, I'll, I'll mention the complement uh, system inhibitors. Um, there's lots of reasons why complement is important in IgA nephropathy, particularly the alternative pathway, which we heard about um, a little bit before, and there were some questions in the chat about this. The lectin pathway always also seems to be important. The classical pathway is probably not important. IgA1 uh, doesn't activate complement, um, uh, but there is a, a bunch of different drugs because the complement pathway is uh, is quite complex. There is a bunch of different drugs that are being studied now for IgA nephropathy that have been or are being actively studied, as you can see here, and they're working across the pathway, and they have different mechanisms. Um, uh, of action as well. So it's really um, this like sort of cornucopia of, of different things. I'll mention just a couple of Acapan. Um, I mention it because it's approved for ANCA vasculitis. Um, uh, but this is an early study that was published. Um, it was done a few years ago and just published in May, I think, um, uh, of, of pilot data of, of using Avacapan, which is a C5A receptor inhibitor. Um, in IG nephropathy, it was just an open label um, study, that, and you can see that there's proteinuria reduction over a matter of weeks. Um, narsoplamab um, targets um, uh, the mannose binding lectin uh, pathway, and this was published in KI reports. 
Again, preliminary data which shows decrease in proteinuria. Um, and I only mention it because this is going on to phase three and it's recruiting um, uh, in a phase three study right now. At the ASN, there was uh, at least two more agents that were described. Simdizaran is an RNA interfering agent that actually blocks C5 production in the liver. Um, and the phase two study uh, results were presented. This is my bad picture, sorry. Um, but you can see that uh, um, it, uh, with, with dosing, this is, um, uh, I think, weekly subcutaneous dosing, uh, proteinuria went down 37% at nine uh, months. And the serum C5 protein really disappeared completely. So it, it's kind of proof of concept that the drug is doing what it's intended to do. Uh, Iptacapan is um, a factor B inhibitor. We're currently uh, enrolling in the phase three study of this drug at Columbia. Um, this uh, phase two results were again presented at ASN, and you can see uh, the phase two results consistently show a decrease in proteinuria versus placebo. This is an oral drug. So, you know, we have opportunities for IV drugs, sub-Q drugs, now an oral drug. Um, acting on a different part of the complement, but it, um, it decreases proteinuria and the complement assays really showed sustained suppression of the alternative uh, uh, pathway. And so the drug is acting as you would uh, expect it to. There's a lot of other things that I could talk about that, that I won't have time to, but just as a, um, uh, you know, food for thought, um, if you think about the B-cell lineage, and there was questions about this earlier, well, it didn't seem that an anti-CD20 drug worked. And again, it wasn't a, a perfect study, but there wasn't really a signal of it working. But there's, there's other ways to target um, these cells and other types of cells that you can target. And uh, the uh, uh, April and BAF drugs that work on uh, B-cell maturation um, uh, 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 factor here um, seem to, to work. What about CD38, which acts on similar types of cells here that, um, that the April and BAF pathway work on, and including plasmoblasts and plasma cells, which are actually the cells that produce circulating um, IgA1, because earlier, earlier B cells that express CD20 don't produce a lot of circulating IgA1. So you could think about targeting plasma cells. And we have drugs that target plasma cells, so anti-CD38 drugs. There's a drug called uh, felsartamab, which is a amorphosis drug that is being studied um, for this indication now. And it's, it has some early evidence in membranous nephropathy as well, but it's a, it's a sort of a logical um, uh, thing to go after. There's lots of other um, uh, activity going on. There's an anti-CD40 uh, ligand drug. There's um, attempts at manipulating the microbiome, including through fecal microbiota transplant. Different types of anti-inflammatories, both new and old. Hydroxychloroquine has some data in, in Asian studies showing it decreases proteinuria. And there's preclinical um, data, which I mentioned earlier, at modified bacterial proteases that might be able to digest, uh, at least in murine models, um, the IgA and ameliorate the disease. And so I think we'll see a lot more to come. Um, this is just to highlight how many, this is just a smattering of phase two and three clinical trials ongoing, um, many of which I mentioned in these different types of drugs, steroids and targeted steroids, endothelial agonists, um, April and BAF uh, uh, blockers, um, uh, and complement blockers, and then an anti-CD38 as well. It's in, in phase two. Some of these studies are named, some others uh, are not, but, but clearly you can see there's a lot of activity. So this will be my final slide, and um, I think the conclusion that you can um, see, and this is a good way to conclude the day, is that there's a lot of activity going on. There's many, many clinical trials of novel therapies, and these have been made possible through all of the, the basic science um, that has been developed to understand the disease. Um, I think when you think about treating patients clinically, supportive therapy is essential. And as supportive therapy gets better, that actually you know, may make it more difficult to prove that other studies are um, effective. But um, regardless, uh, think about SGLT2s um, in, in a lot of your patients. There's lots of promising strategies, which I've highlighted here. And I think it's, it's very easy because it's a complex disease to rationalize a mechanism in IgA nephropathy. You can look at any aspect of the immune system and say, well, that seems to be important in IgA nephropathy. Um, but we are going to need the empirical evidence to reveal what's most uh, important. Like we saw, you know, rituximab doesn't seem to be worth pursuing. Other things uh, do, but we really need the evidence that'll kind of uh, tell us that we can look back retrospectively. Oh, I knew right along it was going to be a complement drug or a BAF or, or endothelin or whatever. Um, and the unmet need remains large. Our patients are still demanding better therapy. So um, we do have a lot of work to do and uh, we will continue to do it.
Um, so uh, I'll conclude here, and uh, I'm uh, among the other hats I wear. I'm the program director of the Nephrology Fellowship, so I'm always thinking about the future um, in nephrology, not just in IGA nephropathy, but I'll use this uh, opportunity to mention that the future is promising and um, uh, highlight my fellows here. And I think that there's uh, a lot more to come. And if we do this conference again next year, I'm sure there'll be lots of new things to talk about as well.